Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and after reliving Ash Ketchum's journey through Kanto, Johto, and Hoenn, we're in Pokemon Pearl to attempt to recreate the Pokemon protagonist Sinnoh region adventure. As a young boy grows and matures, he learns new things and improves. From age 10 to age 10, Ash learned a whole lot, and by the time he arrived in Twinleaf Town, he'd matured as a trainer. He'd also mastered the art of not picking the worst possible Pokemon for every major battle. So, to keep the challenge element of this series, we're going to be going through the entire game with our team level lower than our opponent's lowest level team member. As the original concept for this series was to try to figure out the levels of Ash's Pokemon and use those, I'm going to have to change another piece of this eternally evolving puzzle. By this point in the anime, the show had really veered away from the games and using moves to judge Ash's Pokemon doesn't really work. Instead, using Pokegen, I'm going to keep every team member's moveset accurate to where it was in the show, whilst keeping them at a reasonable level. As always, we're going to be playing through the game with a set battle style, without using any items in battle, held, or otherwise. Alright, let's get into this. Ash Ketchum arrives in Twinleaf Town with his trusty Pikachu, but a change to the regular formula has seen Apom sneak aboard a ship to join in on the fun. That ends up being a lucky break when an intervention from Team Rocket leads to Ash and Pikachu being separated for an entire episode. While the Electric Mouse is stranded in the forest, Ash comes across a Starly on Route 202. Knowing that it could help in the search for his lost friend, he decides to catch it. After a collision and subsequent battle with Apom, the flying type is easily caught. In his debut appearance, Ash's Starly used the moves Gust, Quick Attack, and Wing Attack. Gust isn't a move that the Starling Pokemon can actually learn in the games though, so we're going with just Quick Attack and Wing Attack instead. After Ash and Pikachu are reunited, the duo encounter a Turtwig also on Route 202. There really is a set design for when and how Ash catches his Pokemon in each new region. The Grass Starter battles with Pikachu, but the experienced Electric type comes out on top, and just like that, before even reaching the first gym, we've got a team of four. In Turtwig's first episode, we get to see Tackle, Razor Leaf, Synthesis, and Bite, so right off the bat, the Tiny Leaf Pokemon has a full moveset. After picking up a couple of new team members, Ash finally leaves Route 202 and enters Jubilife City. Shortly after making his way through the city, Starly gets into a battle with Team Rocket and evolves into Staravia. Ash really got a lot done before earning a gym badge in Sinnoh. After evolving, the flying type learns Aerial Ace, and that's about the last thing of note that happens before Ash reaches Orberg. Once he gets to the mining town, it's finally time to take on Sinnoh's first gym leader, Rourke. When the Rock-type specialist starts off with Onyx and Ash sends out Pikachu, we're back in familiar territory. Pikachu has been there, done that, rigged the sprinkler system. The result is no different this time. Ash rounds out the battle with Apom and Turtwig, which is truly the first sign of his growth. There's a Flying-type sitting right there in his party, and yet he selects three team members with super effective moves against Rock-type Pokemon. At this point, he's almost unrecognisable from the trainer who set off from Pallet Town all those years ago. That's largely down to the fact that the quality of animation drastically improved in the 10 years since that day, but also because all of his companions and rivals encouraged him, helping him to improve as a trainer. Okay, so we're going in with our whole team at level 10, which is pretty underleveled, but I'm confident nonetheless. Well, let's give this a go. Rourke sends in his Geodude to start off, and we leave with Turtwig. A single Razor Leaf annihilates the quad-weak Rock and Ground type, giving us a very easy early lead. When the Orberg Gym Leader sends in his Onyx, I decided to go out to Pikachu to better represent the anime and also to make things a little more interesting. After the Rock Snake cuts into Pikachu's defense with an ear-splitting screech, Pikachu scales him and strikes with Iron Tail. That weakens Onyx, but Stealth Rocks are laid on our side of the field, and unfortunately, at the second time of asking, Pikachu isn't up to the task, swinging wide with Iron Tail. An opportunity is opened up for Rourke, and he isn't going to make any mistake. Onyx flings a series of stones right at Pikachu, scoring a direct hit and one-shotting the Electric Mass Pokemon. It's a simple choice to send Turtwig back into battle, and once again, Razor Leaf does its job. A botanical barrage blows away the most successful Pokemon in the history of old Nokia games, and with no choice left, Rourke sends in his ace, Cranidos. The Headbutt Pokemon. Is that a typo? Bulbapedia is calling Cranidos the Head Butt Pokemon. Not the Headbutt Pokemon, the Headbutt Pokemon. That suggests some truly troubling things about Cranidos' anatomy that I'd rather not think about for much longer. The prospect of facing off against one anatomically unhinged Pokemon with another is simply too much to resist, so we recall Turtwig in favour of Apom. The sharp rocks protruding on our side of the field damage Apom on Switchin, who's then hit by a headbutt, taking her down to low health. That's the move headbutt, not some kind of... never mind. As Apom fires off a Focus Blast that's definitely supposed to be Focus Punch, 
Oops. Cranidos retaliates with Pursuit, knocking out the Longtail Pokemon for hacking. Turtwig's the last remaining team member on our side, and although he's damaged by the Stealth Rocks, Rourke's intervention is no good. A potion isn't enough to save Cranidos, who's struck down by the Tiny Leaf Pokemon's third Razor Leaf. Turtwig was probably really confused with all the switching, given that he absolutely tore through Rourke's whole team. That win earns us the Coal Badge and sets us on our way towards the Lily of the Valley Conference. Having completed everything on our to-do list, it's time to leave Orberg behind, head back through Jubilife to Floroma Town, and then through the forest to Eterna City. Ash really doesn't accomplish anything noteworthy between earning his first and second gym badges, so let's move on to the Eterna City gym battle and take on Gardenia. In Sinnoh, Ash really veered away from being super reliant on Pikachu in gym battles, and not selecting him for the face-off with Gardenia is a further sign of growth. Instead, Ash chooses to use Turtwig, Staravia, and Apom in the Eterna City Gym, so let's see how that works out for us. Gardenia has two level 19s and a level 22, so our trio have all been leveled up to 18 to keep us just under her weaker team members. Our movesets are unchanged, and if you pretend that Focus Blast is Focus Punch, then they're entirely accurate to the anime at this point. Right, let's ignore that glaring error and get right into it. Gardenia sends in Cherubi to start, and we lead off with Staravia. This is a little bit of a mismatch. Even with a slight level disadvantage, Staravia wastes no time in picking off his foe. A huge collision from Wing Attack is more than the Cherry Pokemon can handle. With her first team member down, Gardenia calls on Turtwig next, and similar to the Rourke battle, I decided to switch out. In the Turtwig vs Turtwig matchup, we had a pretty clear advantage thanks to Bite. The Gym Leader's Turtwig only had Grass-type attacks, leaving our Turtwig in complete control. Even with her attempting to raise her Pokemon's defense and using items to heal him, Gardenia can't stop us from knocking out her second team member and taking her down to one. Roserade is up last, and this is a significant step up in the class of opposition. The Pokemon games love equipping a region's second gym leader with a super powerful Pokemon, whether it be Misty, Starmie, Bugsy, Scyther, or Gardenia's Roserade, all of whom surpass 500 as far as base stat total is concerned. When Gardenia's ace comes in, we make the switch out to Apom, who's hit hard by Grass Knot on arrival. Given Apom's low weight, that's only hitting as a 40 base power move, which just goes to show how powerful Roserade can be. When she gets close, Apom is able to get off a scratch, but that's it. Grass Knot connects again to finish off Apom and instill the gym leader with a bit of hope. We send in Staravia, but despite his high speed stat, Gardenia's ace still strikes the first blow. Even though it's not very effective, Magical Leaf is still able to cut away around 40% of Staravia's health. Once again though, the Starling Pokemon swoops down to land a wing attack, scoring a knockout and handing us the win. Gardenia forks over the forest badge, and just like that, we're all done in Eterna City. Our next stop is Heart Home City, and after a small bit of travelling, first back to Orberg and then east, we reach our destination. Once we're there, we can get on with picking up our next team member. In the anime, Paul abandons his Chimchar and Ash offers the Sinnoh star to replace on his team instead. After some thinking, Chimchar chooses to team up with a trainer he's been working alongside in the Heart Home City Tag Battle competition. By the time Ash acquires the Fire Starter, he knows the moves Flame Wheel, Scratch, Dig, and Flamethrower. It's a pretty busy time for Ash after reaching Heart Home because just a handful of episodes after adding Chimchar to his party, another new Pokemon joins his side. This one results in a loss to the team simultaneously though. Ash and Dawn realize that Buizel's first love is battling and Apom is more keen on performing in contests so the two decide to perform a trade. The addition of Buizel means Ash now has all of his usual bases covered. Grass, fire, flying, and now water. Along with Pikachu, we now have five team members so we only have one more to add. For now though, let's see Buizel's moveset. The Sea Weasel Pokemon is equipped with Water Gun, Sonic Boom, and Aqua Jet when he joins Ash, so that's what we'll be working with for the time being. Quick side note, Ash's Turtwig also learned Energy Ball at this time, but that's not massively important within the context of the video, so let's move on. The Heart Home Gym Leader isn't around to battle, so after heading through Celestion Town and Route 210, Ash reaches Route 215 where he encounters another new team member in the shape of Gligar. A group of Gligar are trapped in a city that doesn't quite exist in the games and can't escape because of local wind patterns. Ash and friends manage to set the group free and let them back into the forest where they belong. One friendly Gligar decides to stay behind though, having bonded with Ash. Although it's a few episodes before we get to see it use any attacks, Gligar knows X is her sand attack and steel wing as of its first battle. A full team of Pokemon now at his side, Ash heads to Veilstone for the next gym battle. You might have been wondering why I chose to play Pokemon Pearl instead of Platinum, and this is the reason. Ash challenges the gym leaders in the order seen in these games, rather than taking on Fantina 3rd like you would in Platinum. For the battle with Maylene, Ash chooses the team of Staravia, Chimchar, and Buizel, which is a pretty nice little team. 
With Maylene's lowest level team member at 27, the three Pokemon we'll be using will all be at level 26. Since you were last updated, Staravia has learned Brave Bird and Buizel has picked up the move Water Pulse, but other than that, the team's movesets are unchanged. Alright, let's give this one a go. We send out Staravia first, and Maylene leads off with Meditite. Wing Attack makes extremely short work of both Meditite and Machoke, and just like that, we're down to the real meat of this battle. Maylene sends in Lucario last, and we switch out Staravia for Buizel. The changeup allows Lucario to get up close and personal and strike with Metal Claw, but it's not very effective. I wasn't quite sure how to best deal damage against a much more powerful foe, so just ended up settling for Sonic Boom. That ends up being entirely pointless as Lucario counters with a Drain Punch that not only knocks out Buizel but fully recovers all of the Aura Pokemon's lost HP. We send in Staravia to intimidate Lucario and lower his attack, and then make another switch out to Chimchar. Before he's able to get off an attack, the Chimp Pokemon is hit twice by Drain Punch, but that ends up being Maylene's downfall. The two big hits leave Chimchar with only 9 hit points remaining, which means his ability activates. When Chimchar's health falls below a third, his Fire-type attacks get a 50% boost in power, which means that the Flamethrower that cooks Lucario is supercharged. Seeing as controlling Blaze was a large part of Chimchar's storyline in the anime, this victory feels very appropriate. Now that the Cobble Badge is occupying the third spot in our case, we can move on to Pastoria and challenge Sinnoh's fourth gym leader. First though, here's the first run at Maylene where we finish with a very cinematic double knockout. That was definitely my fault, but I think if I'd gone for anything other than Brave Bird, Star Ivy would have been knocked out anyway without taking down Maylene. Okay, let's get on to Crash Awake. Ash picks Pikachu, Turtwig, and Buizel for his face-off with the Torrential Masked Master. This is another solid team selection, so the only thing going against us is the weaker Pokemon and the level disadvantage. Wake's levels are exactly on par with Maylene, so we're going in at the same point, 26 across the board. Our movesets are completely unchanged from the last time you saw them, so let's start the battle. As they do in the anime, Pikachu and Gyarado start off the battle, but this goes a little easier for us than it does for Ash. A Thunderbolt careens toward Gyarados, and when it connects, it lights up the water flying type, obliterating him in a matter of seconds. When Quagsire is sent in, we switch out to Turtwig, and once again we've got a 4 times effective stab move at our disposal. The switch out hinders Quagsire, who fails to hit the grass type with Slam, but when the retaliatory Razor Leaf makes contact, it cuts away almost all of the Waterfish Pokemon's health. The hit really shakes his confidence, and he fires a Mud Bomb wide of his target yet again. Turtwig moves in to bite Quagsire to finish him off, but Wake intervenes and heals up his second Pokemon with a Super Potion. The extra turn of life that the gym leader has given Quagsire is completely wasted when Wake decides to call for Mud Spore. As it turns out, it wasn't just one extra turn. Turtwig somehow manages to miss with back-to-back -back razor leaves, which should never really happen, and at the third time of asking, Quagsire successfully lands an attack. Mud Bomb doesn't really do much to hurt the Tiny Leaf Pokemon though, and when he finally hits with Razor Leaf again, it's a critical hit that blows away Wake's second team member. Floatzel comes out last for the Pastoria City Gym Leader, and finally we have some real competition. After coming in close, Wake's Ace crunches down on Turtwig with an Ice Fang, finishing him off and taking it down to a 2 on 1. Although I know it's extremely unlikely that she'll come out on top, we send in Buizel next against her evolved form. All we really want from this is to give Pikachu the best possible chance when the time comes. The two water types go back and forth with their attacks, but Floatzel moves faster and hits harder, which eventually leads to Buizel's downfall. With a little over a third of Floatzel's health drained and his citrus berry consumed, Pikachu comes in for the final one-on-one. -on -one. A powerful pursuit slashes away around half of Pikachu's HP, but the Thunderbolt he fires back does just enough to knock out Floatzel and score us the win. The Fen Badge officially makes four, and we're halfway through the Sinnoh Gym Leaders. We've got a couple of important things to take care of before taking on the next Gym Leader, though. Using a Razor Fang obtained from Gary, Gligar evolves into Gliscor to save Ash in his time of need. Seriously, Gliscor was the only thing standing between Ash and a certain death. That's not the only evolution that happens between Ash's battles with Wake and Fantina, though. In a battle with Paul, Turtwig faces off against Honchkrow, and in the heat of battle, the grass starter evolves into Grodel. It's no use in the end as it's defeated by Honchkrow despite its best efforts, but that is a bit of extra power that our team probably needed. Okay, I think that's all we needed to cover. Let's get back to Heart Home City and take on this next gym leader. Although two of his Pokemon have evolved since his last competition for a badge, Ash doesn't pick either. Instead, he decides to go for three Pokemon that have never evolved, at least not while they've been part of this team. Weasel, Chimchar, and Pikachu do at least cover a lot of bases, and although Grodel's Bite may have come in handy, I think our team can just about get us through. Fantina's team members are between level 32 and 36, so our trio are all set at level 31. 
Pikachu, Weasel and Chimchar have all got the same moves as they did last time out, so let's jump into it. We start off with Pikachu against Driftblim and it ends up being a perfect start. The Ghost type uses Minimize between Thunderbolts so Pikachu comes through the first face off unscathed. Ms. Magius is out next and at level 36 she could cause our team some real problems. We switch in Buizel with no real logic guiding that decision because I didn't really have a concrete plan for taking down Fantina's ace. That well crafted strategy really comes to nothing as the water type is quickly knocked out without getting a hit in. When Pikachu returns to battle the magical leaf collides with him dealing some serious damage. The thunderbolt that Pikachu fires back doesn't hurt Miss Magius too badly but it does do the exact job I was hoping it would, paralyzing her which gives us the upper hand. Although it could backfire, knowing that Pikachu is going to outspeed Miss Magius, we have to go for Volt Tackle. The physical hit cracks Miss Magius, knocking her out, but the recoil leaves Pikachu with only 8 hit points remaining. When Fantina sends in Gengar once again, we've only really got one option. Pikachu won't be surviving a hit from Generation 1's only fully evolved ghost, so we have to take a punt on Volt Tackle. Gengar spares Pikachu by going for Spite, and Volt Tackle actually takes her into red health and causes paralysis. The recoil knocks out Pikachu and when Chimchar is sent in, Fantina heals Gengar right back up with a Hyper Potion. With the healing up and the Shadow Pokemon paralyzed, Chimchar gets to attack twice so after a flamethrower the Firestarter digs underground. I wasn't sure if Fantina's Gengar had Levitate but I knew another flamethrower wouldn't be enough. As it turns out Gengar floats above the battlefield avoiding Dig which leaves us in a worse position than before. Although I will say that that sort of idiocy does seem right out of Ash's playbook so it is at least fitting for this video. A few turns pass and Gengar's health bar is unmoved while Chimchar is stuck in red health. Breaking through confusion a flame wheel leaves Gengar with a single hit point remaining when a flamethrower definitely would have won us the battle. Why did I go for flame wheel? Truly I have no idea. Paralysis ends up sparing us though. Gengar is frozen in place and can't move out of the way as a powered up flamethrower destroys Gengar handing us another win through the power of Blaze. These challenges always seem to give us battles that feel right out of the anime. Alright, with that we can move right on to Canalave City in gym number 6. Against Rourke, Ash used Pikachu, Apom and Turtwig but he's got an entirely fresh team in use for his face off against Byron. With Chimchar, Weasel and Gliscor we've once again got a really nicely set up team as far as typings go. Byron has two Pokemon at level 36 and his ace is at 39 so our whole team is going into this one at 35. The only move that we've added since you last saw the team is Gliscor's Fire Fang so with that out of the way let's get going. The battle starts off with Chimchar and Bronzor facing off and the type advantage is too much for the Steel type to overcome. Even with Byron splashing the cash and using a Hyper Potion, Bronzor can't get the better of the Sinnoh starter. A Flamethrower wipes out Bronzor giving us the early advantage. Steelix is up next for the Canalave Gym Leader and despite weighing the same as an army of 65 Chimchars, his Steely Exterior is a pathetic defense against Flamethrower. With a single hit wiping out Steelix, only Bastiodon remains for Byron. With massive defensive stats, we really need to take advantage of one of Bastiodon's quad weaknesses. When the Shield Pokemon is sent in, Chimchar digs down, getting ready to strike. The hit takes Bastiodon below half health, but Byron is ready to fight back. When Chimchar emerges, the Rock and Steel type fires off an Ancient Power that takes him down, making it a 2 on 1. Gliscor comes in next and glides in close to attack with Fire Fang. It doesn't do much, but Flash Cannon can't deal big damage either. Staying in close, Gliscor attacks again with Fire Fang and on the second occasion he lands a crit to score a knockout and earn us the Mine Badge. We're now 3 quarters of the way through the Sinnoh Gyms, but before heading onwards to Snowpoint City, Ash enters the Squallville Poke Ringer and for the second time in the series, Paul's Hauntcrow inspires an evolution. While taking on the Dark and Flying type, Staravia evolves into Staraptor and this time it makes the difference. Staraptor ends up winning the competition and honestly, Hauntcrow should start thinking about doing some motivational speaking. It's probably been directly responsible for more of Ash's Pokemon evolving than he has. That's the only thing of note between Byron and Candice, so let's move on to Sinnoh's 7th Gym Leader. The first three Pokemon that Ash sends out against the Ice-type Gym Leader are the Grass-type Grodel, the Flying-type Staraptor, and the Ground-Flying-type Gliscor. That's two regular Ice weaknesses and a nice healthy 4 times Ice weakness to boot. It feels a little like Ash is regressing. Luckily, Chimchar is outlaw, so we at least have one suitable team member for the 4 on 4 matchup. The whole team's at level 37 and we've had a few moveset changes with Gliscor replacing Sand Attack with Screech, Staraptor adding Close Combat in place of Wing Attack, and Grodel learning Rock Climb. Okay, let's do this. Candice leads off with Snover and we start off with Chimchar which is really bad news for her. 
One flamethrower flattens the quad weak frost tree Pokemon and her evolved form can't do any better. Chimchar outspeeds Obama Snow to connect with Flamethrower and score another knockout. Sneasel's out next for the Snowpoint Gym Leader and once again we've got a 4 times effective move. We recall Chimchar and send in Staraptor who takes a couple of hits from the speedy Cat-Weasel hybrid before hitting back with a devastating close combat. I feel like that would have knocked out Sneasel about 7 times over but once is more than enough for now. Medicham comes in last for Candice, and before she even realises she's been sent into battle, Staraptor crashes into her with Brave Bird, knocking her out and handing us the win. There's only one more Sinnoh gym to conquer before we can go on to the Elite Four, so let's move on from Snowpoint. Ash takes on Paul on the shores of Lake Acuity, and with its burning determination to defeat its former trainer, Chimchar evolves into Monferno. In the end, it's not enough, and the firefighting type is taken far beyond its limit and destroyed by Electabuzz. I really have Paul to thank for the decent team that Ash put together in Sinnoh. Man, Paul is the best. I mean, he's the worst, but he's so damn good at being the worst. Next up, we've got to rescue the late Guardians from Team Galactic. We don't have Dawn and Brock with us this time around, but after Cyrus takes control of them, we manage to free Azelf, Mesprit, and Yuxi from the clutches of Team Galactic. Ash really gets a lot done between Snowpoint and Sunny Shore. After freeing the late Guardians, we have to say goodbye to Gliscor as it heads off to train with Makan, the Air Battle Master. We'll see more of the Fang Scorpion Pokemon later though. I'm sure you all know what opening up a spot on the team means. Ash really thinks in black and white. If you have six Pokemon on hand, you don't need to catch anything new. But if you've got less than six, you need to throw every Pokeball you have at the first thing you see. Whether that be a Pokemon, a plant, a tree, Brock, it does not matter. You throw them hard and you aim for the face, and if you get lucky, you'll have a team of six soon enough. For Ash, that thing happened to be a Pokemon, and that Pokemon happened to be Gibble. To show how focused Ash was, Gibble debuted about 30 minutes after Gliscor left Ash's party. The Dragon Ground type has Dig, Dragon Pulse, and Draco Meteor when he joins Ash's team, and that's about all you need to know. Seriously, there's such a long time between Ash's 7th and 8th gym badges that Monferno has time to evolve into Infernape despite reaching its second stage since Ash took on Candice. Paul and Electabuzz are nearby when Monferno evolves, because of course they are, that's sort of the key to all of this, isn't it? Right, this is the last one, I promise. Paul is notably absent as Grodel reaches its final stage, but Ash did go back to the old well that is Team Rocket. Grodel evolves into Torterra, learning Leaf Storm in the process, and finally, finally, we can move on to the last of Sinnoh's gym leaders. Volkner really gets to see Ash's big guns facing off against Torterra, Pikachu, and Infernape. Even with all of the moving and shaking, we've still only got a couple of additional moves to add. Aside from Torterra's Leaf Blade, Infernape's Mock Punch is our only new move. This is actually the first gym battle all game where we've had a different number of Pokemon to the gym leader. Even with one less, we're still going in underleveled. That means Torterra, Pikachu, and Infernape are all at level 45, so one last time, let's get into the gym battle. Leading off with Torterra against Raichu gives us the upper hand early on. Although Torterra doesn't know any super effective moves, his partial ground typing greatly limits Volkner's first Pokemon. Without the use of electric type moves, Raichu uses his speed to strike first with Brick Break before Torterra can hit back with Leaf Storm. That harshly lowers his special attack, so for his next hit, Torterra uses Rock Climb. Volkner's Hyper Potion stops the attack from knocking out Raichu, but it can't prevent the confusion. Unfortunately, colliding with Raichu paralyzes Torterra, but he's already noticeably slower, so it shouldn't make a massive difference. After getting off another Brick Break, Raichu is hit hard by another Rock Climb that knocks him out, handing Torterra the first win of the match. Octillery comes in next, so switching out to Pikachu makes the most sense with Torterra's damage special attack. A powerful Octazooka crashes into Pikachu, leaving him immediately weak and lowering his accuracy. The Electric Mouse quickly charges up and speeds at Octillery, smashing into the Jet Pokemon and knocking him out in one. The badly damaged Pikachu can't handle the recoil damage from Volt Tackle and collapses from his injuries, leaving us in a 2 on 2. We're choosing our next Pokemon first and opt for Infernape on our side. Volkner sends in Luxray so we get straight underground preparing to hit the electric type with Dig. It's a powerful shot but a Citrus Berry heals Luxray up a bit before he counters with Crunch. It's not very effective though and Infernape heads back underground ready to strike again. Dig does enough damage to warrant a full restore but that just gives Infernape the benefit of time. While Luxray is busy recovering from his injuries, Infernape attacks twice with Flamethrower, knocking out Volkner's ace, leaving him with only one. That final team member is Ambipom, and truly, it's tough to be intimidated by a Pokemon who's taking styling tips from Coconut Head. 
Infernape fires off a flamethrower to get Ambipom started, and when his only defense is agility, the flame Pokemon does a bit of showing off, demonstrating true speed with a match ending Mach Punch. Volkner is defeated, and with a beacon badge added to our case, we're finally ready to challenge the Elite Four. Unlike previous generations, all of the Elite Four and Champion appeared in the fourth generation of the anime. Aaron, Lucian, and Cynthia never faced off against Ash, and although Bertha and Flint did, they only used one Pokemon each. Both of those battles happened before Ash acquired his 8th gym badge, so instead I'll be using the team that he chose for his Lily of the Valley conference match against Paul. That team was made up of Pikachu, Infernape, Staraptor, Buizel, Torterra, and Gliscor, so it's the perfect representation of his Sinnoh group. Both of Ash's 6 on 6 battles with Paul are fantastic, and I think using this team makes the most sense. The Elite Four's first member has two level 53s, two level 54s, and a level 57, so we're going in with our whole team at level 52. As far as new moves go, we've got Infernoop's Flare Blitz, Gliscor's Giga Impact, and Stone Edge, and Weasel's Ice Punch, which are actually some really nice moves to add. Ash really deserves credit for actually setting up a usable team in his journey through Sinnoh. It took him 10 years, but he got there in the end. Let's give this a go. Up first, the bug type member of the Elite Four, Aaron. I wasn't anticipating any problems in this particular matchup, and I was probably right not to be. Infernape runs through Aaron's team exactly like you'd imagine a monkey with a flamethrower would deal with a moth, a butterfly, a scorpion, a beetle, and a bee. That should probably make Aaron question his future as an elite trainer. Let's move on to Bertha. The ground type member of the Elite Four leads off with Quagsire, and we start with Torterra. Three fifths of Bertha's team is quad weak to grass, so the continent Pokemon is going to play a major role in this one. It doesn't take long for an energy ball to wipe out Bertha's starting Pokemon, and for some reason she chooses to send in Whiskash next. Torterra barely even notices when Whiskash fires a rock slide in his direction, but the energy ball that he returns flattens the water ground type. Sudowoodo's out next for the second Elite Four member, and wanting to give some other team members a chance, we swap in Buizel. The water type gets off some good hits, taking the rock type into red health before ultimately falling to Sandstorm. It's a decent performance, and when Pikachu comes in, it seems like he'll have an easy job, but Bertha uses a full restore to get her back into the battle. Pikachu's speed allows him to strike twice with Iron Tail and Volt Tackle, but Sudowoodo's high defense keeps her on her feet. A devastating hammer arm knocks out Pikachu, but Static leaves the imitation Pokemon paralyzed. We send in Gliscor, who strikes twice with x to knock out Sudowoodo, who's done some real damage. After Bertha's ace Hippowdon comes in, Gliscor attacks with Giga Impact before we switch Torterra back into the match. Hippowdon attacks with Stone Edge and Earthquake, but Torterra is far too bulky to care. Energy Ball isn't quite enough to finish the job, but after one more Stone Edge, a final Energy Ball wipes out the ground type's remaining health. Golem's up last for Bertha, but Leaf Storm absolutely demolishes the quad weak Megaton Pokemon. Bertha put up a bit more of a fight than Aaron, but still didn't do a lot to stop us. Let's see if Flint gives us a more competitive battle. The battle starts off with Flint's Rapid Ash taking on Buizel. Once again, the water type isn't quite up to snuff though. Although not for the first time, she's got to deal with her opponent being healed up halfway through the matchup. A series of Aqua Jets and Water Pulses still deal a fair amount of damage, and when the Fire Horse Pokemon strikes with Flare Blitz, it leaves his HP below half. That puts Gliscor in position to score a knockout with Stone Edge as soon as he enters the battle. Flint's Infernape comes in second, and Gliscor attacks with Stone Edge, but with the major level disadvantage, it doesn't do too much. A critical hit on Flare Blitz knocks out Gliscor, evening up the battle. Staraptor is the obvious choice to replace Gliscor with his super effective stab flying moves and sky high attack stab. Infernape hits first with Mach Punch, but after being intimidated by Staraptor, it really doesn't do a lot. When the Predator Pokemon hits back with Aerial Ace, it wipes out the rest of Infernape's hit points, leaving us in complete control. Flint sends in Steelix next, but then allows Staraptor to strike three times with close combat, which does two things at once. It simultaneously knocks out Steelix while lowering Staraptor's defense and special defense three stages. What follows is one of the most bizarre sequences of move selections that I've ever experienced. Flint just seems unwilling to attack Staraptor. Low Punny comes in, and even with Flint using a full restore, the normal type just hops about trying to charm Staraptor. By the time Lopunny goes down, Staraptor's stats are essentially non-existent. A light breeze would body him at this point. Driftblim's out last for the third Elite Four member, and the streak continues. The Ghost is set on only using Double Team for some reason. Despite having virtually no attack power remaining, Staraptor is still able to deal a bit of damage with Brave Bird. Eventually, I settled on switching out Staraptor, who had earned some rest after an amazing performance. Pikachu comes in, and with a Volt Tackle, he leaves Driftblim paralyzed with almost no hit points left. 
Having raised his evasion several stages, the ghost is able to burn Pikachu and then finish him off with Ominous Wind. So, with Aerial Ace in his moveset, we bring Staraptor back out to get the job done. The attack connects, but unfortunately Drifblim's aftermath ends up finishing off Staraptor too. The flying type avoided every attack under the sun, only for victory to take him down. Three battles into the Elite Four and we've coasted through on three supreme individual performances from Infernape, Torterra and now Staraptor. Lucian's up next and we're now a long way behind in level, so this one could be tough. Lucian leads off with Mr. Mime and we start out with Gliscor. x Scissor hits hard at the beginning of the battle, leaving Mime on the cusp of unconsciousness. When Light Screen is his best defense, Lucian tries to prolong his time in battle with a full restore, but that's a total waste of an item. Gliscor gets a free chance to hit back-to-back -back X Scissors, and that's more than enough to deal with Lucian's first team member. So, with one Pokemon down, we haven't lost a single hit point. Good start. Medicham's up next, and with his partial fighting typing, X Scissor doesn't do nearly as much as it did against Mr. Mime. The Ice Punch he fires back is four times effective though, so we don't need to worry about X Scissor's effectiveness for long. Staraptor's next in line, and after flying in close, Brave Bird blows away Medicham. Lucian's Alakazam comes in third though, and the combination of speed and special attack could be a real problem for us. Before Staraptor can even get back into his rhythm, he's completely wiped out by Psychic. Weasel can't do any better, going down before she can even set up to attack. Pikachu's our next Pokemon out, and when Alakazam switches from Psychic to Focus Blast, he misses, allowing the Electric Mouse to strike with Volt Tackle. That does hit hard, but not hard enough. Alakazam opts to return to Psychic, and that means the end of Pikachu. We're down to just two Pokemon now, and one of them is weak to Psychic-type moves. We send in Torterra, and thanks to some seriously bad luck, the Grass and Ground-type is defeated by Alakazam, who has now taken down two-thirds of our team. Infernape's out last, and once again we get lucky, with Alakazam choosing to go for Focus Blast, which once again fires wide. Flamethrower cuts down the Psychic-type, who's made our team look like absolutely nothing. Lucian still has two Pokemon standing though, and they both have Stab Psychic in their moveset. Girafferig's out fourth, and after Flamethrower deals some real damage, Psychic takes Infernape from full health down to 11 hit points. That kicks Blaze into effect, allowing a second Flamethrower to take it down to a 1 on 1. As it turns out, Lucian's final Pokemon is Bronzong, who's weak to fire, so even with a major level disparity and a high special defense stat, Flamethrower one shots the final Pokemon of the Elite Four, handing us the win against all odds. Seriously, the number of times Blaze got us across the line in this playthrough really made it feel like I actually had Ash's plot armor. So, with the Elite Four down, only the champion remains. Unfortunately, in hours of attempts, I never got close to taking down Cynthia with our team at these levels. As one of the strongest trainers across the entire series with a fantastically diverse and powerful team, it was just never going to happen, especially with items in the mix. Instead, I got the entire team up to level 59 to keep them under Cynthia's whole team who were all in the 60s and levels. Okay, let's give this one last try. If we can't beat her at this point, then we're gonna have to call it a loss. Cynthia leads off with her Spiritomb, and we send in Gliscor first. It's not a perfect matchup, but based on how the rest of this battle is set to play out, Gliscor seems like our best bet. Gliding above the battlefield, Gliscor delivers a series of stone edges that knock out Spiritomb before Psychic can deal too much damage. Cynthia sends in her Milotic next, and we don't really have the luxury of switching around against Pokemon this powerful. We just have to stay in and fire off a Giga Impact, which leaves Milotic hurt before Surf washes away the ground and flying type. Cynthia's Milotic is speedy enough that I don't really trust Pikachu to get a hit in at all, so we go on to Staraptor instead. The Predator Pokemon lands a powerful hit with Brave Bird before Milotic even sees it coming. When Cynthia sends in Gastrodon, we switch Staraptor out for Torterra, who has a couple of quad effective attacks. Gastrodon Sludge Bomb poisons Torterra, but the Leaf Storm she responds with is too much for the Sea Slug Pokemon to withstand. The Sinnoh Champion brings out Garchomp next, and seeing as Torterra's done his job in this one, we leave him in an attack with Leaf Storm. With his special attack harshly lowered, the move doesn't do too much damage, and before long, the mock Pokemon wipes out Torterra with Brick Break. Okay, this is it. Weasel hasn't had a great run in the Elite Four, but this is her time to shine. The water type dodges Garchomp's Dragon Rush and then gets close and connects with a swinging ice punch that obliterates the pseudo legendary Pokemon. When Cynthia sends in Roserade, Weasel's ready and quickly lands another super effective ice punch. It leaves Roserade struggling to stay on her feet, but the sludge bomb that she retaliates with cuts down Weasel in one. Still, Weasel did a ton of damage and that's all we can really ask for. Infernape comes in and even with a full restore, Cynthia can't save Roserade. Flamethrower one-shots the bouquet Pokemon, leaving the champion with only one. 
When Lucario is sent in, we switch out to Pikachu for some reason. I was all but certain an earthquake was coming, so why I went out to Pikachu when Staraptor was right there, I'll probably never know. It might have something to do with the fact that I'd been battling Cynthia for hours and this was my first time with a good chance to win. We send Staraptor in and after spending 30 seconds choosing, we call for close combat. Staraptor's finishing blow is so powerful that it just annihilates Lucario in a single shot, handing us the win. We've officially taken down Cynthia and beaten Pokemon Pearl using the exact team that Ash used for every major battle. More or less. This battle was by far and away the biggest challenge in the game, which is pretty appropriate. This is also hands down the best team that Ash has put together so far, so this was a nice enjoyable run. Okay, well, I'll get around to 5th gen soon enough, but until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.